This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to a closer look at pro-regenerative biomaterials. Thank you for making it to this session today. We're looking forward to an exciting session. And with that, I'll introduce you to our first speaker, Karen Chrisman. Dr. Chrisman completed her PhD in bioengineering at UCSF and Berkeley in 2003, and then did a postdoctoral fellowship in polymers and nanotechnology at UCLA. In 2007, Dr. Chrisman joined the faculty at the Bioengin Bioengineering Department at UCSD and became full professor in 2016. In 2020, Dr. Chrisman became Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Welfare at the Jacobs School of Engineering, as well as being appointed as the Deputy Director of the Institute of Engineering and Medicine at UCSD. Dr. Chrisman is also the co-founder of Karyos Technologies. Dr. Chrisman has received numerous awards and honors in recognition of her multiple significant contributions to the development of biomaterials to promote tissue regeneration. And today she's going to tell us about some of the, that work and the progress that she's made on it. Karen. Thanks so very much for the, the kind introduction and welcome everybody. Thanks for being here uh, virtually. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna kick off the session today and um, talk about probably something a little bit different for the, the series, which is focused more on, on stem cell technologies. Uh, so we do work in the field of regenerative medicine, but we take a little bit different approach, which I'll, I'll tell you about today. So we work on uh, pro-regenerative uh, biomaterials and particularly injectable materials that could be delivered uh, minimally invasively. Uh, so for disclosures, as Sylvia mentioned, I'm co-founder of two companies. I will mention some of the work of, of Ventrix today. Uh, so before I get into um, the, the main talk for today, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what my lab does. As I mentioned, we focus a, on a little bit different aspect of regenerative medicine. Um, we focus on biomaterial technologies, and we work with a variety of different biomaterials, um, some that are naturally derived, um, coming from animal sources, so extracellular matrix derived, which is what I'm going to focus on today, since um, um, we've had the most success in terms of regeneration and as well as clinical translation with those type of materials. But we also do work with synthetic polymers as well as synthetic uh, nanoparticles. And as I mentioned, everything we do is injectable um, with the goal of having minimally invasive procedures um, to speed up recovery time, reduce chance of the infection, and basically make it easier on the, the patient. So our main focuses are on uh, Traditionally, have been on cardiovascular disease, so treating myocardial infarction or heart attacks, as well as peripheral artery disease, and that's um, what I'm going to focus my talk on today. And then a few years ago, we also started working um, with Dr. Alperin, who's going to talk about um, some of our joint work on treating pelvic floor disorders. But in all of these cases, it's basically treating either cardiac muscle, so the heart muscle, or uh, damaged skeletal muscle. So I'll start off with the heart, which is something that I've focused on for a couple decades now. Uh, so I'm sure everybody is well aware of the, the problem we have with heart attacks and heart failure in this country. Um, sadly, it's still the leading cause of death in the Western world. Um, two thirds of heart attack patients do not make a complete recovery. So there are about a million in the US, there's about a little over a million heart attacks each year. So if those are survived, two thirds don't make a complete recovery. And what happens is the heart goes through what's called a negative left ventricular remodeling process, which basically means it goes through a remodeling or adaptation process where the heart actually dilates and expands. And I'll explain that a little bit more on the on the next slide. Uh, and that leads to heart failure where the, the, bud, the, the heart can no longer pump blood effectively to support the, the body. And right now, there are no therapies that prevent this negative, it's basically a negative feedback loop, feedback loop from happening. And there's also uh, no therapies other for in-stage heart failure, really other than heart transplantation or left ventricular assist devices, which are mechanical pumps. Um, and of course, there's lack of donor or, uh, 
uh, donor organs, uh, and then the mechanical pumps have a lot of other downsides as well. So really, there's a strong need to develop new therapies to treat the heart, um, especially regenerative ones that could prevent this entire process that leads to heart failure um, from happening or, or treat heart failure patients who are already in heart failure. So to give you a little bit better idea of what happens when you have a heart attack, how that leads to heart failure. Uh, so um, when you have myocardial infarction, the, the term for heart attack, that uh, what happens is you get a coronary artery or one of the blood vessels that supply the heart. Uh, it has a blockage and that leads to lack of blood flow to um, a specific region of the heart. And so what happens is you get death of the cardiomyocytes or the cardiac muscle cells. Uh, and that's typically what people think about, that you have a heart attack, you get death of your cells. However, there's also something else that's really important that happens, is that you get degradation of the ECM or the extracellular matrix. And so this is the, for those who don't know, this is the, the basically the structural scaffolding that all of your cells and each of your tissues sit inside. So you can kind of think of it like scaffolding for a house and then your the cells are, are sitting inside. So when you have a heart attack, not only are your cells dying off, you also get degradation of this, this extracellular matrix scaffolding. And I'll talk about why that's important in a second. And so because the heart is really not a regenerative organ, this leads to scar tissue formation. So just like you would cut, you know, probably most people when they were a kid um, have cut themselves really badly and then you have a scar on your skin. Uh, it doesn't heal completely. Basically that same process happens in the heart. Since it's not regenerative, you're gonna get a scar inside of the heart. And then it leads to what I mentioned, this negative left ventricular remodeling process. So here is the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. And it goes through uh, essentially a negative feedback look, loop that's trying to compensate for this weakened region where you have the heart attack. And eventually that entire ventricle dilates or expands and the volumes increase. Um, and then the heart can no longer pump blood effectively and that leads to, to, to heart failure. So there have been a lot of therapies, including stem cell therapies, that people have tried um, injecting into what's called this infarct region, the heart attack region. Um, but the problem is they're injecting cells into a very um, abnormal environment. So if you look at a section of uh, a heart attack under a microscope, and this is what's called an H&E stain section, you can see this pink here is basically collagen, which is scar tissue. It's the major protein of scar tissue. And this is not a, a normal environment or normal microenvironment for the cells. So when your people are delivering stem cells into this area alone, they're seeing this very abnormal environment that basically is providing disease cues to the cells. So it's not too surprising that the cells alone haven't worked very well. And so what we focus on a lot is that extracellular matrix and the, the lack of extracellular matrix and trying to stimulate um, regeneration of the, the body's own uh, tissue using, an, using the extracellular matrix. And so why the extracellular matrix is so important is that, as I mentioned, your tissue or the heart is not just cells. It sits in this extracellular matrix scaffolding, it has this like nice kind of fibrous network. So here's if this is your cell, you have um, basically this fibrous network that the cells sit inside. And the extracellular matrix, all of these fibers actually uh, provide significant cues that influence essentially all aspects of cell behavior. So cell survival, death, uh, division, differentiation, et cetera, can all be influenced by this extracellular matrix. So it's incredibly important. Um, and so I, I, again, I think that's been uh, an oversight in the initial type of regenerative strategies that people had tried for the heart. And then the other thing I'd like to point out in terms of the importance of the extracellular matrix is that each tissue has its unique unique extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix of your heart is very different than say your intestine or your, your lung. So what, we, what we've thought about, especially initially um, in trying to regenerate the heart, we've thought about instead of injecting cells into this abnormal environment, why not inject an extracellular matrix replacement that provides more natural healthy cues for the body's own cells or the endogenous cells to migrate in um, and to try to regenerate the heart. And so that's what we, a lot of our projects have focused on this extracellular matrix kind of replacement strategy to provide a new template for healing uh, and to stimulate repair in, in, in this case in the heart. And I'll show you later on in, in skeletal muscle as well.
So the, the technology we developed is what we call our, for the heart, is called our myocardial matrix hydrogel. Um, so we wanted to design an injectable material that you could deliver minimally invasively, but would replace all of those cues of the original extracellular matrix. And that's really hard to do from a synthetic strategy because the extracellular matrix of your heart, as well as other tissues, is really hundreds of components, a lot of different types of proteins, but also sugars or, or polysaccharides. And so what we decided to do was take a more more naturally derived approach and really give what nature or take advantage of what nature gives us already. Um, so in this case, we take pig hearts. Um, we isolate just actually the left ventricle, which we're trying to treat. We chop it up into small pieces and then stir it around in a detergent like you see here to what we call decellularize it, which is we strip out all the cells and isolate just the extracellular matrix. And then we uh, dry it and mill it into a fine powder and then use an enzyme to partially enzymatically digest it, which basically is converting this from a solid into a liquid that can be injected. And then what's really cool about the material is when you inject it back into tissue, Right here is our myocardial matrix hydrogel. This uh, kind of purplish uh, tissue here is what um, a rat myocardium looks like. So here, uh, once you inject this liquid back into tissue, it reassembles back into a porous and fibrous structure that's very similar to the original extracellular matrix. So this inset here is actually the extracellular matrix from this step before we've done any of the processing. So you can see in terms of the pores, kind of the, the, the holes as well as the, the fibers are quite similar. And if you look at it with a, a scanning electron microscope, you can see these fibers are actually on the nanometer scale, which is very similar to the, the original extracellular matrix. And we optimize this whole process so that the material could be delivered via catheter. And in the heart, what that means is you're accessing at the femoral artery in your groin, and the catheter is staked up through the aorta, um, major vessel in your heart, and then it goes inside the left ventricle, and the catheter has a little needle at the end that can be deployed or, or retracted, and then you can inject the material. Uh, so just to give you a visual on that process, um, this is a, a quick video that uh, one of my former students, it's actually a little old now because she's, she's a cardiology fellow at Vanderbilt, but it's still probably the best video we have of describing the process. Here, I'm a PhD student in the Chrisman lab, and this is how we make our therapy for treating heart attacks. So we get heart tissue, and the first step is we chop it up into tiny pieces and we put it into a bath, like a beaker right here, and stir it up with uh, detergent so that to remove all the cellular contents. After a couple days, uh, we rinse it out to remove all the detergents, and all we really have left are the structural proteins that make up a tissue. So we take that and we freeze dry it into this styrofoam-like substance. It's really light and crispy. Uh, so it's freeze dried and then we take this and we mill it into a fine powder that looks like this. Um, we take that and digest it with an uh, enzyme to liquefy it. And you can see that there's liquid at the bottom of this and this little bead is just stirring it up and keeping everything well mixed. And then finally we take the liquid form of this and we inject it into the heart, into damaged heart tissue and once the liquid hits body temperature, it forms a gel that looks like this, and it no longer flows anymore. So I believe that gives you a little better idea of what the material looks like. The process is relatively speaking quite simple to make it. I always say usually you can teach any undergrad how to do it in, in just a couple of weeks. Um, so we, we've taken that material, we've studied it in a lot of different preclinical models. I'm going to show you briefly um, some of the data from the more translational large animal model that was needed before going into patients. Um, so we injected this into a pig heart attack model where you get, first give the pigs a heart attack. Um, then you we deliver the material through that uh, catheter system that I just mentioned. And then we took the animal, so we delivered that two weeks after the heart attack, and then we took the animals out to three months. And what we saw were significant improvements in global function, really the making or preventing uh, the heart from dilating. So we had reduction in volumes, both at in systole, which is the end of contraction, and then in diastole, which is the end of relaxation when the heart's relaxed. Um, here's showing uh, ejection fraction, which is a measure of cardiac function, basically um, a fraction amount of blood um, that is pumped out of the heart. And you can see pre-MI or pre-heart attack, um, you have a, a normal ejection fraction 
infection for pigs. Two weeks after the heart attack was given, you can see it has this decrease that continues to decline in the control animals. And then with our matrix hydrogel treated animals, we had significant improvements in, in cardiac function. And the reason why um, we thought that where we think that's occurring is that when we looked at histology or tissue sections, here um, is of our matrix, an example of our matrix treated, and here's one from our control using what's called a trichrome stain, which stains muscle in red and collagen in blue. And so we saw this thickened band of muscle that also had um, vasculature supporting it. And if you quantify that compared to control animals, that was significantly greater. And then also we quantified the collagen content in the scar, and that was significantly less. So essentially more cardiac muscle and less scar tissue. And we think that was leading to these improvements in, in uh, contraction or, or cardiac function. And we've done, as I mentioned, a lot of different preclinical studies, um, uh, both in terms of uh, looking at cardiac function, but also understanding mechanism of action. And we really do find that these materials act as a, a new template for healing. So um, in multiple studies, we see that this material is pro-survival, it decreases cell death, uh, increases the immunomodulatory response, so really shifts instead of a very pro-inflammatory inflammatory environment that you have after a heart attack, you actually get more of a pro-remodeling and pro healing environment and you shift the immune cells uh, to be that more pro-healing phenotype. We also saw um, increases in blood, blood vessel development as well as indications and in increases in, in heart development. So really, like I said, it is a new template for healing. Uh, so that work, as well as a lot of other, especially significant safety studies to look for potential for arrhythmias, um, biocompatibility, uh, hemocompatibility, which is compatibility with blood, all of which lo looked great, um, led to Ventrix, which is the company I co-founded, creating or conducting a phase one clinical trial in heart attack patients using the same catheter delivery strategy I mentioned. Uh, so here's what the material looks like uh, commercially. It just comes as a dried cake laphalized cake, you add sterile water right before you're ready to inject, um, and then you're ready to go. And so the trial was a small just phase one trial because um, people have used decellularized extracellular matrix patches in surgery, actually in millions of patients, but nobody had used this hydrogel form of an extracellular matrix in any tissue. So looking at a small safety study was a really critical first step. Uh, so use the catheter technology I mentioned, and then half the patients were treated between 60 days and one year after their heart attack, and half the patients, um, so about 15 patients in total, half the patients were treated one to three years after the heart attack, so really an early and a late group. Um, and we looked at baseline and three and six months um, at some measures of mainly for safety and feasibility, but also um, some measures of efficacy, um, even though it was definitely not powered and there's no control group, but we wanted to see whether um, it, there were some potential indications of improvement. And so overall, as I said, this is primarily designed for safety, and we found that VentraGel was well tolerated, which was an exciting result since this was the first of its kind an ECM hydrogel going into any tissue, and of course the heart is a high-risk organ. Um, but we also did see some encouraging uh, secondary endpoints and efficacy, significant increases in six-minute walk tests, which is how far a patient can walk in six minutes, decreases in um, New York Heart Association heart failure class, uh, which is basically decreases in heart failure symptoms, and then 80% of patients either maintained or improved their volume. So basically we we're helping to prevent further dilation or expansion um, uh, of the heart in these patients. So encouraging for a phase one trial and Ventrix is continuing clinical um, development on this. Uh, so next, I wanted to switch just briefly to um, talk about skeletal muscle instead, but still uh, a cardiovascular disease. So peripheral artery disease, probably many of you have heard of, but many of you may not have because it's not as um, talked about as, say, heart attacks or heart failure, but it still affects a very similar number of patients. So uh, PAD, peripheral artery disease, affects about 27 million patients in North America and Europe, so it's a huge patient population. And what this is, it's also caused by atherosclerosis, as opposed to though um, a heart attack where you get this uh, acute like initial event where you get a clog of an artery, this is more of a progressive narrowing of arteries. So it's a, a little bit more of a, a chronic uh, condition. And what happens is because 
because you get this narrowing of the arteries, you get decreased blood flow to the limbs, um, and you also get muscle atrophy. So the skeletal muscle in the limbs atrophies or decreases in size and so becomes weaker. And so initially, um, the earlier stages or the, the less severe stages called intermittent claudication are things when patients, say, have pain upon exertion. But eventually, um, or in the severe case, you have critical hemostemia where you have pain at rest and you get things like gangrene and needing an amputation. You can see about 120,000 patients in the U.S. each year need an amputation because of this. And right now, there are no effective therapies. So because we had seen increases in uh, vascularization in the heart model, and overall anti-inflammatory prohealing effects, we wanted to see if the general strategy of ECM hydrogels could be used to, to treat PAD patients or in a model of PAD. And so we used uh, what's called a rat hilum ischemia model, where you basically create, um, you surgically remove one of the arteries and veins to in the leg to create this region of low blood flow down to the, the one limb. And then we look at percent perfusion, which you can is as a proxy for blood flow. And um, we either injected saline as a control or we injected the ECM hydrogel derived from skeletal uh, muscle. So porcine skeletal muscle. So the identical process I showed you for the heart, but in this case, we're using um, uh, skeletal muscle. So just, you know, what we would consider meat um, as opposed to, to cardiac muscle. And so if you look at saline, basically that plateaus, you know, high 60%, whereas we get significant increases in blood perfusion, again, a proxy for blood flow with injection of our skeletal muscle extracellular matrix hydrogel. And we did histology and looked at tissue sections and found we, in fact, did increase uh, blood vessels, particularly arterioles. And then what was also interesting is that we found an increase in fiber area of the, the skeletal muscle cells or the skeletal muscle fibers. So as I mentioned, in PAD patients, peripheral artery disease patients, you get at muscle atrophy, which is a decrease in size. So this also happens in the rat model. So here's healthy um, muscle. And then if you look at the saline group, the saline control, you can see a decrease in fiber area, which means that the muscle is atrophying, whereas we basically prevented this um, with our skeletal muscle extracellular matrix hydrogel. And the reason why we think at least this is partially occurring is that we got a significant increase in what are called PAC7 positive cells, which are the, the skeletal muscle satellite or se skeletal muscle stem cells um, compared to, to saline that we think was helping with the, the regeneration. And then interestingly, in a subsequent study, um, in a different model, not a hind limb ischemia model, but using what's called a no-texan injury model, you essentially inject a toxin into muscle and watch it heal. It's very common for a common model in the muscle physiology field. We, using that model, we look to see if you inject saline versus ECM hydrogels that are derived from the skeletal muscle, like I just showed you, or our cardiac muscle ECM hydrogel or a lung ECM hydrogel, all porcine derived, um, using very similar processing, but only the skeletal muscle, only the tissue-specific extracellular matrix hydrogel got that significant increase in PAC7 positive uh, stem cells. So we do think having tissue specificity in terms of the ECM hydrogel and the, the tissue type you're trying to treat uh, is important. And then just for the last uh, really couple minutes, I just wanted to, to briefly mention some of the work we've also been doing um, towards trying to develop new therapies for COVID-19, which of course has been dominating all of our lives and why we're on Zoom right now. Um, so because our extracellular matrix hydrogels have been shown to be anti-inflammatory and pro-healing, um, as many of you have probably read in the news, COVID-19 um, not only affects uh, or the infection from SARS-CoV-2, not only it infects and, and causes a problem in the lungs, but it's really a systemic inflammation, inflammation all over the body and multiple organs, um, that's an issue. So we wanted, given what we knew about these ECM hydrogels, we wanted to see um, if this kind of strategy, a pro-healing anti-inflammatory biomaterial strategy, might be able to use to dampen inflammation once somebody gets um, developed severe COVID-19. And so what we wanted to do is then develop 
a hydrogel though that could be delivered systemically. Ideally you deliver it in the blood, it could go all to all the organs because the ECM hydrogels that I showed you before require injections in specific locations. So that really wouldn't work with something that's really systemic like COVID-19. And so we developed a version of the hydrogel, same processing where you take, um, in this case, heart, process it to the that liquid stage. And instead of relyophilizing it um, and having it ready to store it and inject, we actually fractionate it into the low molecular weight fractions and the high molecular weight, basically the more soluble or very small nanoparticles to the, the, the greater uh, sizes or the insoluble components. And then you can relyophilize this, what's called a supernatant, this liquid, and then it's ready to go and rehydrate it. And what we found is you can actually inject this intravenously um, or into other blood vessels, and it will target areas of inflammation. So in, in areas of inflammation, you actually have leaky vasculature and you have gaps in the endothelial cells that line each blood vessel. So here um, in this image, green is endothelial cells, red is our matrix, blue is nuclei of cells. And you can see it actually seems to um, bind to and potentially gel within the gaps of the endothelial cells. So we found that, and we found this in multiple models so far, that you can inject it into the blood and then it will target to areas of inflammation. And we found it, in fact, it does in a model. We don't use the virus um, since we're not equipped for that, but we use uh, what's called an LPS, a lipopolysaccharide systemic inflammation model that it causes severe inflammation across the entire animal, in this case, a mouse model. And then what you're looking at here is basically profiles of uh, inflammatory genes. And you can see the M uh, animals here are all matrix, the S here are all saline and control, and hopefully you can appreciate the, the difference in colors between the, the two groups. Um, and basically what we found with this in doing this inflammatory gene panels, we saw a dampening, in this case I'm showing you the heart and lung, but we found it really in, in all the organs that we've tested as well, so far as well as decrease in the inflammatory cytokines in the blood too. So we're still studying this further. Um, hopefully COVID with all the vaccines won't be such an issue anymore severe COVID-19, but um, we do think this could be also used for other um, causes of acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, and things like sepsis. Uh, so with that, just a brief summarize, hopefully I've convinced you that um, there are other uh, regenerative medicine, medicine strategies, and we think ECM hydrogels really are a versatile, uh, minimally invasive platform for treating uh, multiple different types of pathologies, including myocardial infarction, peripheral artery disease, I mentioned COVID-19, and then Mariana is going to talk about her expertise, which is in uh, pelvic floor disorders. So with that, I'd like to really thank all the members of uh, my lab, both current and former, um, especially my current uh, lab who, you know, everybody's had a, a rough time this year and they've been chugging away in the lab trying to, to get things accomplished. So the, particularly the, the COVID-19 team, which is um, Annie Lyons, uh, Ray Wang, a former member, as well as Ryan uh, Middleton, who've been working on the COVID projects. Um, the skeletal mus muscle project was really um, by Jessica Ungerleiter and Todd Johnson, both former students of mine and then the cardiac work has been uh, really many of the names that you see up here have been have contributed to the the cardiac work as well as um, think ventrix and our clinical investigators uh, as well as the the funding sources so thank you very much and then i'll be happy to answer questions uh, later on thank you so much karen for that very uh intriguing presentation sounds pretty exciting that uh, phase one trial Dr. Alpern received her MD degree at St. Louis University School of Medicine in 2001, and then she did her fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, where she also did a master's of science in clinical research and design. Dr. Alpern then did a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard. And then from there, she went to Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles to become the founding chief of the Division of Urogynecology. In 2012, we were lucky enough to recruit her here to the Department of Reproductive Medicine at UCSD, where she is now associate professor. Since 2019, Dr. Alprin has been the fellowship research director for the Division of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Alpern has been the recipient of many awards and honors in recognition of her work, which has focused on understanding diverse aspects of female pelvic skeletal muscle function and disorders. 
what she's going to talk to us about today. Mariana. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for this introduction. So today we will talk about how the materials that Karen described can be applied to the female pelvic soft tissues. So the female pelvis has a big aperture that is filled with different structures, including connective tissue, skeletal and smooth muscles, and the ner nerves that innervate them. And as the humans became obligate bipeds, the interplay between structural components that are critical for the proper function of the female pelvic floor became even more important. Because when these components fail, one or the group of them, pelvic floor disorders can occur. And pelvic floor disorders is an umbrella term, and unlike a myocardial infarction, potentially less familiar to the audience, so I will describe it, it consists of pelvic organ prolapse. Here in the picture, you see the uterus that is coming out. It certainly shouldn't be uh, there. And the urinary and fecal incontinence. And these conditions are very prevalent. Approximately 25% of the U.S. community-dwelling women are affected. And even the, with the projection that by 2050, close to 44 million U.S. women will, have, will suffer from pelvic floor disorders. And unlike myocardial infarction that can uh, cause directly cause death, pelvic floor disorders um, impair quality of life. They impair quality of life so much that in a recent uh, Journal of American Medical Association articles where the participants were asked to rate various conditions on the, on the scale much better than death, somewhat better than death, a little bit better or worse, astoundingly, approximately 55% of participants rated bowel and bladder incontinence as worse than death. I just want to point out that the next runner-up was relying on a ventilator. So this is a devastating condition that's been known since antiquity. The first description has been encountered in Egyptian papyruses in 1800 BC. At the time of Hippocrates in 400 BC, you can see here a woman depicted hung upside down in order to correct her prolapse. And the first surgical intervention for pelvic organ prolapse was performed by Saronis of Ephesus in 120 AD in the form of vaginal hysterectomy. There are multiple risk factors for pelvic floor disorders, including family history, genetic predisposition, pregnancy, vaginal delivery, mechanical factors such as obesity, hormonal deprivation associated with menopause, and aging. However, vaginal delivery by far is the leading risk factor for pelvic floor disorders, increasing this risk by four to 11 times. And therefore, it represents the most important potentially modifiable risk factor. Despite this high prevalence, that's almost epidemic proportions, currently available preventative strategies are limited to cesarean sections, which of course have a host of untouted side effects that we want to avoid. And there's a lot of risk factors where women should not undergo cesarean sections, it's undesirable. And in terms of the available treatments, they're all pretty much delayed, compensatory, and don't really address the underlying pathophysiology. In fact, we really haven't evolved very much from ancient Egypt, where they used pomegranates as a form of pessary, which is a device to support the prolapse. In Europe in the 1800s, a bronze pessary was used now, our patients benefit from the silicon-based materials, but it's still a pessary. So as you can see in this timeline, we haven't really made a significant leap forward in our treatments of these devastating disorders. And this represents a significant scientific disparity that is especially pronounced when it comes to the female pelvic floor disorders. So we were, I was fortunate to have a program like Galvanizing Engineering in Medicine, or JAM program, which is a partnership between UC San Diego Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute and the UC San Diego Institute of Engineering in Medicine. And this program's goal is to identify clinical challenges for which engineering solutions can be developed and implemented to improve healthcare. So if, through this program, oh, Karen's and my partnership had fostered. And this program is very much aligned with the NIH vision that multidisciplinary approach to clinical care and research is the most fruitful paradigm for the development of significant advancements within a specific field. So today, out of all the pelvic soft tissues that can get injured during vaginal delivery, we will focus on the pelvic floor muscles. Here you can see a superior view of the schematic of the human pelvic floor muscles, which consists of the coccygeus muscle, in orange, iliococcygeus muscle in, in green, and pubovisceralis muscle that has two parts, pubococcygeus and puborectalis, 
Together, the latter two represent something called levator ani, a term that might be familiar to some of you. And the reason we're focusing on the pelvic flow muscles is because pelvic flow muscle dysfunction has been recognized for a long time as a major contributor to the development of various pelvic flow disorders. As all skeletal muscles, pelvic flow muscles also contain contractile myofibers that are organized into fascicle bundle fibers and extracellular matrix, which is also hierarchically divided into epimysium, which surrounds the entire muscle, perimysium surrounding fascicles and bundles, and endomysium surrounding individual fibers. Individual fibers are composed of the functional muscle units called sarcomeres, which I arranged the, the carts on the train. And in turn, sarcomeres are comprised of the myosin and actin, which are called myofilaments. The contractile myofibers are responsible for the active mechanical muscle properties, while extracellular matrix is responsible for the passive mechanical properties like load-bearing capacity and muscle stiffness. In order to prove that vaginal, why vaginal delivery is the leading risk factor for pelvic floor muscle injury, a lot of groups, including University of Michigan group, whose work is I'm going to discuss briefly here, perform computational modeling of human parturition. Here you see a, a picture of hum, fetal crowning with this um, net-like structure representing the fetal head, and then the green-like structure representing a levator ani complex. And the different colors is how much strain is imposed on different components of the pelvic floor muscle complex. And it was identified that tremendous strains need to impact these muscles during parturition. And especially the specific point called anthesial region of the pubovisceralis muscle, which is where the muscle is attached to the pubic bone, that can achieve strains up to 250%. Now, these strains are so large, there's certainly a huge excess of 60% strain that is enough to permanently injure the muscle. So we wanted to know, what is the impact of mechanical strains associated with parturition on the pelvic floor muscle myofibers? In order to do that, we used a widely used simulated birth injury model. We specifically used rat, but it can be done in a mouse model or other uh, animal models. And we used a Foley catheter balloon that is somewhat modified and in, induced vaginal distension, which simulates the circumferential and downward distension associated with fetal crowning, as in rats and humans, as you can see here. Now, here is the gross picture of the pel pelvic floor muscle, specifically pubocaudalis portion of the rat levator ani, where on your left, you see a normal intact control muscle, um, which is outlined in blue with the star asterisk is, uh, identifies the anthesial region, the one that undergoes tremendous stretch during human parturition. And on your right, you see the appearance of that muscle after the injury is performed acutely. And you can see that see-through appearance and that see-through appearance and due to dramatic stretch of the muscle and therefore myofibers. And um, in fact, the stretch ratios for pubocaudalis muscle in simulated birth injury model reach the same stretch ratios as were identified in the computational models of human parturition. So several fellows in the lab, our um, female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery fellows, identified what is happening at the intrinsic structures of the muscle from these strains. And what they discovered is that sarcomeres, those functional units that I showed you that are arranged the carts on a train, undergo significant hyper elongation immediately upon birth injury. And that is a known mechanical injury of skeletal muscles from the investigations done in the limb muscles. And this sarcomere hyperolongation is associated with something called myofibrillar disruption. Here you see an electron micrograph of the uninjured pelvic floor muscle on your left and injured on the right. And what becomes immediately apparent is that well-aligned sarcomeric structure um, of the uninjured control muscle is disrupted. And as you can imagine, that would not be conducive to force generation. We know from the limb muscle studies that such myofibrillar disruption that comes from the follow sarcomere hyperolongation eventually leads to a significant inflammatory response by the tissue and long-term manifests as fibrosis, which is a pathological accumulation of collagen in the muscle and myofiber atrophy, which means smaller fiber size or death of the myofibers. Together, these two degenerative conditions can lead to muscle dysfunction. 
So we wanted to know, does this acute sarcomere hyperolongation leads to this long-term pathology of the pelvic floor muscles? Because that has never been investigated. And uh, Pamela Duran, which is a PhD candidate that Karen and I co-advise, as well as one of the master students um, in my lab, they performed these experiments where they used a simulated birth injury that I described previously, and then they, ho they housed the animals and allowed them to recover for either four weeks or eight weeks, at which point the animals were sacrificed and the tissue was procured to assess fiber area, which is a marker of myofiber atrophy, and collagen content, which is a marker for fibrosis. Here you see in the first panel, you see the control cross-section of the pubocodalis muscle where all the rats... Um, different shapes, but this is the red is the laminin and it outlines individual fibers. And that is what we use to calculate fiber area. And at four weeks after the simulated birth injury, the fiber area was significantly decreased. But at the same time, we noted the centralized nuclei, which is a metric of a regeneration because when the muscles, uh, de novo muscles, they have a centralized nuclei that subsequently migrates to the muscle periphery. So because it was significantly larger, we didn't know, is this because the regeneration is ongoing or is that really because of atrophy? So this is where the eight weeks animals came in handy. And eight weeks after the injury, the number of centralized nuclei returned to control levels, which means the regeneration was no longer taking place. However, the fiber size stayed lower than the uninjured controls, indicating myofiber atrophy. Our second outcome of interest was the pathological accumulation of collagen. So here you see a cross-section of the rat pelvic floor muscle where collagen, it's a trichrome stained, where collagen is in blue with the myofibers in pink. And you can see just by eye, even without uh, looking at the quantification below, that there is much more blue after the birth injury at four weeks as well as at eight weeks. In fact, the significant increase in collagen content um, did not differ between four and eight week time points and was significantly increased compared to the uninjured controls. So then we wanted to know, what are the mechanisms accountable for this pelvic floor muscle phenotype following birth injury? Specifically, we wanted to focus on the tissue morphology at the very beginning after the injury ensues from one day to 10 days. And we were combined it with the gene expression studies that spanned a one day to 35 day time course. We know from the studies of the appendicular muscles that the first event upon muscle injury that is required for muscle regeneration is the infiltration with leukocytes. This starts the pro-inflammatory stage, which is characterized by type one macrophages and Th1 helper cells, which are responsible for cleaning cellular debris. Subsequently, this switches under the regulation by uh, regulatory T cells. The switch to the pro-regenerative phase occurs, which is characterized by the type 2 phenotype of macrophages and TH2 helper cells, which are responsible for tissue remodeling and repair. And this all occurs within the first seven days post-injury. So we know that the inflammatory response of the tissue to injury is very much um, connected to the muscle stem cells that Karen had mentioned, uh, they're the resident stem cells that normally present in a quiescent state. However, upon injury, they undergo activation and, can, and they, after activation, they can go to different routes. There is a subpopulation of muscle stem cells that under, undergo differentiation without proliferation in order for them to respond very quickly to injury. And that usually occurs in three to four days in the limb muscles. And the other subpopulation of this muscle stem cells, which is characterized by PAC7, undergo proliferation and self-renewal to repopulate the stem cell pool. And this is normally occurs at five to seven days post-injury. So in our um, morphologic assessment of the pelvic muscle's response to birth injury, here you see a cross-section of pubocodalis muscle with the tightly packed myofibers, as we had seen before. At one day, we saw a profound myofiber death. At three days, we saw significant cellular infiltrate, which is the immune infiltrate. And by seven days, we identify centralized nuclei, which as you can recall, is a metric of muscle regeneration. So then we, with that in mind, that at, despite these events that were anticipated at the beginning, we know that at the end, the pelvic floor muscles underwent atrophic and fibrotic changes. So we designed gene expression screening panel with those in mind. We know that immune infiltrate that induces inflammatory response can impact muscle anabolism, catabolism pathways, fibrogenesis, and myogenic pathways. 
So we focused our custom panel on these pathways. First, we looked at the myogenesis, and myogenesis followed the expected time course that I described. With the upregulation of myogenin, the marker of differentiated muscle stem cells by three days, and upregulation of PAC7, a marker of proliferating and non-differentiated stem cells by seven days. With the help of the postdoctoral scholar Francesca Boscolo in my lab, we wanted to confirm that our gene expression studies correspond to the histological assessments. And using immunohistochemistry, we determined that myogenin did indeed go up starting at one day, but ma with the maximum increase by three days. And then um, PAC7, which is the marker of those uh, um, self-renewable cells, was maximally increased at seven days post-injury. This also corresponded with the um, large expression of the embryonic myosin heavy chain, which is the marker of the de novo myofibers, which would have the centralized nuclei. So all of this was very consistent, showing that the myogenesis followed the expected time course. We then focused, um, again, Pamela Duran partnered up with Lindsay Burnett, another fellow, FPMRS fellow, who works um, in, on basic science projects, and they determined that the gene expression studies that looked at the inflammatory pathways showed sustained pro-inflammatory response after birth injury, even at 35 days. They also discovered impairment in pelvic floor muscle anabolism and a progulation of the pro-fibrotic genes in response to birth injury. So this was responsible for that phenotype we speculate, that we saw basically myofibro atrophy and fibrosis at long-term time point. So clearly, we need to develop an optimal healing environment at an optimal time point to avoid pelvic floor muscle dysfunction associated with that phenotype. We can use it at the time of birth trauma to prevent pathological alterations or at a delay time point to promote constructive remodeling that can revert pathological alterations. We hypothesized that delivery of tissue-specific skeletal muscle extracellular matrix hydrogel that Karen described will prevent and revert pelvic floor muscles atrophy and fibrotic degeneration. But just as it is not easy to deliver things to the heart, it is actually not easy to deliver things to the pelvis, the pelvic floor muscles, which are structures deep in the pelvis. So at the start, we partner up with our um, radiology colleague, Eric, Dr. Eric Cheng, professor of radiology at UC San Diego. And with the resident Vipul, partnering with Pamela Durant, they did they developed a minimally invasive approach to deliver this material directly into the pelvic floor muscle. And here we, you see we're using um, basically the system that we used allowed us to deliver the material through transapterator approach um, because the muscle here in blue, as you can see, overlays the uh, medial surface of the obturator foramen through which we can introduce the needle and inject the material. We confirmed the reliable delivery of the material into the muscle by staining the material with either India ink or um, a fluorophore. And you can see here the um, dissection of pubocodalis muscle in situ. After the delivery of the material, the black is the India ink that was in the hydrogel delivered specifically into the enthesial region of the pubocodalis where most strains occur. And then um, on the right is the, the red is the fluorophore that was uh, hydrogel laden with the fluorophore shows the delivery of the material into the muscle belly. So the study designed to answer these questions was divided into immediate injection where the animals were randomized into saline or hydrogel injection immediately upon simulated birth injury, and then were housed for four weeks where fiber area and collagen content was analyzed. And for delayed injection, the animals underwent simulated birth injury, after which they were allowed to recover for four weeks, at which point they were randomized into saline or skeletal muscle hydrogel injection and housed for another four weeks for the same outcomes. And what we saw is that an immediate injection resulted in a, it, both saline and the extracellular matrix hydrogel prevented pelvic floor muscle at atrophy, but only the hydrogel resulted in increased fiber size that returned the fiber size to the co uninjured controls. And um, um, both mitigated fibrosis somewhat, but much more pronounced in the hydrogel group. Both modulated immune response but skeletal muscle hydrogel promoted an earlier progulation of myogenesis pathway and decreased expression of profibrotic related genes, specifically TGF-beta. In the delayed injection group here, we observed pretty similar results. 
saline and extracellular matrix hydrogel prevented pelvic floor muscle atrophy with the fibrocytes uh, greater in the um, hydrogel group compared to saline, both modulated immune response as well, and um, extracellular matrix hydrogel enhanced the myogenesis and downregulated expression of profibrotic-related genes. Interestingly enough, we saw the mitigation of the fibrosis with saline to be a similar extent as it is with the hydrogel. In conclusion, birth injury leads to significant pathological alterations of the red pelvic floor muscles long term, impairing muscle anabolism, upregulation of profibrotic genes, myofibro atrophy, and fibrosis were observed. Skeletal muscle extracellular matrix hydrogel prevents the red pelvic floor muscle atrophy and mitigates fibrosis. We think by modulating immune response and impacting myogenesis. Saline injection, interestingly, four weeks post birth injury also positively impacted muscle regeneration. And I once again want to thank the UC San Diego um, JAM CTRI grants that really encourage the team science that allows us to bridge the long standing gaps in female pelvic medicine. And of course, many thanks to my uh, collaborator, Dr. Chrisman. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Alperin. That was uh, very interesting, especially the, this, the observation about the saline was interesting. Um, we'll see now, uh, it seems that we have some questions lined up here from our audience. There's one here uh, from Richard Robertson that says, it's uh, for Karen, it says impressive difference in porcine hearts with and without ECM therapy? Are those new cells from stem cells or fill in from adjacent regions? Yeah, thanks for the question. So excellent question. I get that question a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. So if you're looking at its skeletal muscle, the answer is yes, at least partially we do get a, a stem cell component, as I, I mentioned um, when I talked about the skeletal muscle. In the heart, um, identifying really what a true um, stem cell is a little bit more challenging. And actually, Sylvia um, can talk to this a lot better than I can. Um, but what we, so it, I don't want to rule it out that it doesn't exist in the heart, but right now we think it's probably that increase in muscle is, is coming from two things. One is the, the pro survival effects. We know we have seen that it decreases cardiomyocyte apoptosis. So it decreases the death of existing cardiac muscle cells. So a lot of those cells will die off immediately after heart attack, but it's actually, there's um, a significant number that will continue to die off um, in patients actually years um, for years. So we help decrease that cell death. And then we've also recently found, actually in collaboration with Sylvia's lab, um, that we have indications of also cardiomyocyte proliferation. And I'd say, um, and maybe Sylvia can help answer this too, but I, I think right now the, the cardiac field, if you see regeneration, I think a lot of people think it's likely predominantly having a component where you're having more proliferation. So I don't want to rule out that there's a stem cell component that we haven't discovered yet, but right now we think those are the predominant two components. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you for that question. Next question is from Chin Chuan Zhang. Um, in the treatment of heart failure, <clears throat> is the extracellular matrix of embryos or younger hearts better than that of adults? Yeah, so we, we actually, it's many years ago now, probably close to eight, almost 10 years ago, we really were interested in that question. Um, however, from a translational standpoint, we quickly realized that you really it would be difficult to use younger sourced hearts. One, just the access to them, and two, their small size, just in terms of making like a big batch that you could scale would be really difficult. Um, so we kind of gave up on that concept, but it, it was something we were very interested because younger animals are more proliferative and so potentially the ECMQs would be more proliferative. Um, so subsequent to that, um, Lauren Black, who's at Tufts, they actually did those experiments using rat extracellular matrix. So um, got to give his credit to his grad students who meticulously isolated very young, teeny tiny little rat hearts, um, created material. And they did in fact find that they got more proliferation of cardiomyocytes. Um, it, that was more of an in vitro experiment, if I remember correctly. So outside the body, 
anybody, but they did see that the younger matrix was better. Um, but the issue from a translational standpoint, like I said, is I don't think you can make a, a kind of clinical batch size of the of a small heart even from, from pigs because it's so small. But I think if you could, the, the therapeutic benefit might, might be even better. Okay, thank you. And one more question for Karen from Ksenia Malokina. I hope I pronounced that right. Did injection of porcine skeletal ECM into the rat model cause any complications due to differences in ECM between the porcine and rat models? Yeah, so um, actually, so there, so extracellular matrix is actually quite conserved among species, and as long as you remove the cells and appropriately decellularize the material, um, you can actually use xenogenic or, or different species sources. So actually, there, as I mentioned before, that there's surgical patches made out of decellularized extracellular matrix, and actually most of those are porcine derived. Actually, even some are. Um, equine, so horse or bovine cow derived, um, and they've been shown to have a pro remodeling. You don't get a rejection response unless you inappropriately de decellularize it. And if you leave too much remnant cell debris, then you get a rejection response. But otherwise, you can cross species um, without, it, without an issue. Okay. I think, uh, let's see, we've got some more questions here. Uh, Jin Hu. Could we use cultured human cardiac fibroblasts to prepare ECM instead of porcine hearts, which are not easy to obtain? So theoretically could, and I'm blanking on the group's name, but there's a group, I believe it's out of Wisconsin, that ha has tried doing this. I think the issue is that it's actually much harder to obtain large quantities because you would have to do massive cell culture, which actually porcelain hearts are very easy to obtain, um, especially in this country. Um, we don't use them really for food much in this country, so it's considered a byproduct. Uh, so you, it's very easy actually to get um, porcelain hearts just from food hogs because they're not used. Use. So it's actually a quite readily available source and you can scale it much easier. Whereas trying to culture cells, you would, it would be significantly more expensive to obtain um, that extracellular matrix. And then it's also a question, it, it's not going to be the identical matrix as what's in a heart um, too. So whether that makes a difference or not, I don't think has been, been well studied. Okay. And from AC, any studies in the heart ECM therapy with adjunct stem cells added? So we have yeah, a good question. So we've, we've done a little bit of that um, where more just feasibility. So we have found that you can get some increases in survival by delivering cells. Um, but because we didn't think we knew the best cell type to deliver in terms of my lab, um, you know, what would be the best cell? Um, we just stopped at kind of the feasibility stage. But um, the, I think there are there is potential for that. And we have a, a couple companies actually that are, are interested in, in looking at the, the combination of the the material with cells so i think the jury's still out on that but i do think it's promising particularly with you know some of the newer uh cell technologies that are out there okay um and maybe this is a question now that mariana can help us with um from julian in what we have talked about uh you were mentioning how interdisciplinary this work has been um with the two of you interacting um is there a strong collaboration between chemists, physicists, and biologists, as well as physicians and engineers from different industries? I don't know about the specifically with the industries. We certainly do try to collaborate with our industry partners. Um, but again, in my field, it mostly the most collaboration has been about biomaterials or the synthetic materials that were that I use that. Um, you know, unfortunately associated with a lot of different complications that many of you probably heard and the mesh related complications. So that was our partnerships with the industry by engineers. And also, of course, creating the synthetic materials did involve physicists and chemists that work uh, in those industries. In my department of obstetrics, gynecology and reproductive sciences, there is a strong partnership between reproductive biologists and uh, clinicians who work on the in the endocrinology uh, world that affects, for example, polycystic ovary disease and others. In, in the female pelvic medicine, unfortunately, the collaborations with the chemists and physicists has not been profound. But I certainly 
think that given how far behind our field is, way behind cardiology, for example, or oh, orthopedic surgery, where a lot of what we do, we look at what the appendicular muscle studies show and then see what's applicable in our world. I think that those partnerships would be invaluable because we really can gain a lot of time and um, make it economically feasible if we adapt some tools that have been developed in other fields instead of developing them de novo. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, both of you, for really fascinating presentations. It looks like uh, we've answered everybody's questions. And uh, we'll just uh, perhaps end here and thank you both very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks.